Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36 this morning. We're in a series as a church called Teach Us to Pray for the next number of weeks. Major pastoral burden that we had coming into 2024 was that we, we wanted to give attention to this category of prayer, personal relationship with the Lord and prayer as a church. And before I read this passage, I, I just want to state that this obviously is a, a precious passage to every Christian, ought to be a precious, pre- precious passage to every Christian. Uh, this is the Garden of Gethsemane. And its main point, if we were going through Matthew or many of the other Gospels, the, the main goal of any exegetical message preaching about the Garden of Gethsemane should be the Lord Jesus Christ and how it reveals Him as He anticipates the cross. And I certainly will seek to make that point this morning, but I, but I want to look at this passage through the lens of prayer this morning. So we're going to take it from a particular angle and see what we can learn about prayer. So I just wanted to say that ahead of time. I'd like to read it even with that lens. What, what does this passage tell us specifically about prayer. It's not a passage primarily about prayer. It's primarily about Jesus, but I I want to ask what it can teach us about prayer as we ask this question of the Lord, as his disciples did, teach us to pray. So with that expectation and that lens on, let's begin reading Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. This, as every Sunday, is God's holy, inerrant, an authoritative word. Let's begin reading. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death, Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Lord, bless the preaching and the obeying of your word. My oldest child, when she was just crawling, had no sense of her own danger. Zero sense of danger at that stage. She would crawl to the edge of a bed without any pause and crawl right off the edge of the bed and plunge headfirst towards the floor. Now, to my knowledge, she never actually hit the floor because we would catch her, and I think we caught her every time. But it was remarkable to me, the absence of any awareness of her danger. We'd put her back, there she would go, right to the edge and right over the edge. Never a hesitation uh, until eventually she learned that she was vulnerable. She had no sense of her own danger, apparently full of confidence at that young age. Now, she belonged to me, and so there were times when I would catch her after she went over the edge. 
And what is, I think, in a baby, sometimes a humorous, at least it was for me, a humorous and potentially dangerous overconfidence in a disciple of Jesus is a fundamental and enduring problem. Now, we belong to Jesus, and we do not have in, oursel- in ourselves the power to save ourselves, ultimately or even from temptation. We do not have in ourselves the power to save ourselves, but he does. Praying is that communication to him that we want his strength to lift us up, to guard us from the fall of temptation. Now, we pray for many, many things. We ask the Lord for many things according to His will. But one of the chief reasons we pray is because we are conscious of the fact that apart from His strength lifting us up, we will fall. We will fall into temptation. And prayerlessness is the equivalent of that baby crawling over the edge of temptation with nary a thought of what will meet them at the bottom. This passage, if we look at it through the lens of prayer, invites us to see the danger of temptation and the call of the Lord to pray as those who belong to Jesus. That's my overarching claim this morning, that we would pray as those who belong to Jesus, pray as those who have an appropriate concern for the potential of our own temptation, our own fall. We would pray with that fall in view as those who belong to Jesus and who are distrustful of our own strengths, that we would pray with that appropriate sobriety of the edge that is in front of all of us every day and throughout this life until we see Jesus in heaven, that edge is in front of us and we do not have the strength to survive the fall. So we need the Lord Jesus. And we should pray as those who belong to him. Now, I want, I want to just make two points this morning in looking at this passage through this lens of prayer. The prayer, the prayers of the disciples and the prayers of Jesus. So we'll look at the disciples first and then at Jesus, okay? So first, the prayers of the disciples. You notice in verse 36, Jesus comes to Gethsemane, very familiar for many of us, and he says to his disciples, sit here while I go over there to pray, So the thing we first notice when Jesus will exhort them to prayer later on is that they are motivated firstly by his example. Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed a lot. And this passage, perhaps more than any other, reveals the mystery of his human nature, which he added to his divine nature so that Jesus functioned in life the way a regular man would, yet without sin. So he was not divinely, if we could put it that way, uh, protected from the temptations of sin. So he needed the strength of his Father, humanly speaking, to guard him on his path. And he wanted independence on his Father as every human should. So there is a a modeling here, and we actually see this throughout the ministry of Jesus. There are repeated references to Jesus praying. So for example, in Mark 135, we read this about Jesus, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he, Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. The Son of God in his human form, prayed. We read in Mark 6, 46, after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Luke 5, 16 records, he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Luke 6, 12, in these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And then in John 17, we have Jesus' magnificent intercession for his disciples. So repeatedly, and here again in Gethsemane, before the great moment, we have Jesus' example modeling for the disciples what what should have been plain to them. If Jesus has to pray, then surely disciples ought to pray. If Jesus, with all of his wisdom and power and righteousness, craved and longed for personal communion and dependence with God, His Father, then surely 
The disciples ought to pray. Now, we might not see that because we don't have this pattern that would have been very common in those days of a disciple and his master. But, but in those days, they weren't nearly as independent and self-sufficient and arrogant as we are as in our day. We, we tend to pride ourselves in, I do it my way. Not so back then. A disciple was to follow and imitate his master. So what the master did, you should seek to do. That was part of the goal of being a disciple. So when Jesus prays, what should have been on their mind is, I should do what I see him doing. So his model for them then extends also to us. That they ought to have been motivated by his example. But our prayers are not just motivated by his example, they're also motivated by our need. The great enemy of prayer emphasized in this passage is self-sufficiency. And the great goal is that we would not fall into temptation. These disciples were certainly chosen because they were selected as a unique inner circle, but also because these men were particularly proud. They were particularly proud. Immediately before they came into the garden, Peter had confidently proclaimed that though all might fall away, he would not. He came into the garden with the warning of Jesus ringing in his ears, before the rooster crows twice, you will have denied me three times. Three times. He had said in the upper room, you will all fall away. They were aware that one of them, apparently Judas, we don't know what they knew at this point, but apparently Judas, that someone was going to betray him. So so they came into the garden. It wasn't like these warnings were a distant memory. There is the potential that you might fall into. They, They were, within the last hours, he had said, Peter, you are going to deny me. You are all going to fall away. One of you is going to betray me. The the. presence and imminence of temptation should have been ringing in their ears, and despite that, they feel no urgency. In effect, they are racing towards a cliff with the warning of Jesus ringing in their ears, you are racing toward a cliff. You will face temptation It is too strong for you. And yet apparently they feel no urgency of their need for God's help. Jesus having communicated his own agony and having prayed returns to them and finds them sleeping. And he said, you want to notice, to Peter. So he addresses himself to Peter, though the verbs are plural, so it applies to them all. So could you not watch with me one hour? Now, I I know that it's possible for this to be interpreted as sort of a lonely Jesus, uh, desperately upset that he's not being helped by his friends in companionship. I, I don't think that is the main burden here. I think the main burden for Jesus is even as he's facing his own agony, he is concerned for their souls. He is concerned for Peter. And so he has this very telling yet very gentle rebuke to Peter. Peter. You who say you can stand the test that is coming. You who say you are strong enough to pass every temptation. You cannot even resist the temptation to sleep when you should be praying. Here is the estimate of your real strength, Peter. Even the gentle call to sleep is too great for your strength. The the obvious implication is, what of greater temptations, Peter? You you do not have the capacity to fly over these temptations unscathed. So could you not watch one hour? James and John, who were there as well, had told Jesus, we are able, confidently they had said, we are able to drink the cup of suffering that you will drink. And yet here they are, having been told they would fall away, feeling no urgency to escape that temptation. So, Jesus exhorts Peter very specifically, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
He's saying, I, I don't question your desire, your noble desire, Peter, certainly is there. Your spirit is, is willing to be loyal to me. You, you don't intend to deny me, but you need to recognize the weakness of your flesh. You are an infant facing a cliff. It's not that you're not willing. It's not that you don't have a desire to be a faithful disciple. It's that you are incapable of overcoming this temptation. Don't equate your desire with your capacity, Peter. Don't equate your good intentions with your actual strength, Peter. Because you can state good intentions and good desire and good willingness, you assume that you're in a safe place. No, you are weak. You are hampered by a weak flesh that is vulnerable to a fall. How easy for us to see that same need in us. In our day when religion is idealism and certain claims of loyalty to a certain religious system, and yet not to have any urgency in our own souls about our vulnerability to temptation. That's what this passage reveals. It's very intentional that this passage is lodged right between Peter's boast that he would never deny Jesus and then his denial of Jesus when he's on trial. But very intentional that Peter and his story is woven together with Jesus' final hours before the cross because Peter, in many ways, exemplifies all of us. We, we have a certain confidence, a, a certain willingness, and because we detect a, a, a loyalty to Jesus at some level in our heart, we have no urgency that we are vulnerable, that our flesh likewise is weak. D.A. Carson says this, Jesus' prediction of their spiritual defection that very night, verse 31, should have served as an urgent call to prayer. So now he tells them that only urgent prayer will save them from falling into the coming temptation. Even in his own extremity, when he needs and seeks his father's face, Jesus thinks of the impending but much lesser trial his followers will face. The solution, Jesus says, is a spiritual watchfulness over his self-confident soul that expresses itself in prayerful dependence on the Lord. Only urgent prayer, Peter, will save you from this fall. You will fall into temptation unless you seek the assistance of the strong arms that can hold you up. You will fall unless you ask for help. You will fall. You are weak. You must pray or you will fall into temptation. What should Peter have been doing? He should have been confessing his need. Lord, I am weak. I am proud. I think I'm strong, but I'm not. Show me my pride. Help me. Give me strength for the temptation to come. I don't want to deny the master. Show me his glory above my own protection. Strengthen me to love him more than I love myself. Prayers like that were the need of the hour. Now, notice something else that this self-sufficiency keeps Peter and James and John from. These three are apparently aware of the agony of the Lord. He says to them, my soul is troubled even to death, but we see no record of any prayer for him either. And that it, it, this is the only moment in all of history where prayers for Jesus were an opportunity of disciples. N never again. Never again could a human being actually pray for the Son of God. This was the moment. <laughs> this was an extraordinary opportunity of discipleship, an extraordinary opportunity where in his human nature, Jesus is praying, and they could have prayed for him. We see no evidence, despite his agony, that they showed any concern that the Lord would strengthen the Lord, that God the Father would strengthen His Son. Self-sufficiency, and this is true for all of us, it not only makes us vulnerable to our own weaknesses, it keeps us from seeing the needs of others. It keeps us from intercession for them because pride is always focused on itself. 
sometimes when it's allowed to run rampant, we actually dismiss the weaknesses of others because we can't understand why they can't be self-confident the way we are. Whereas the more we are aware of our own vulnerability, our own weakness, we are also aware of the vulnerability of others and our prayers extend out from our own worry about temptation to praying for them. Notice Peter and James and John, they, they can't even be bothered to pray for Jesus. How much better if Peter, James, and John, a little huddle there in the garden, had prayed, Almighty God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our master is in an agony. I don't understand why, but give him strength. God of Elijah, send down your spirit on Jesus right now. Anoint him. Meet with him as you met with Moses on the mountain. Lift up the light of your face upon this beloved one. Our God, Yahweh, strengthen him. We have no record of any prayer like that at all. Peter's self-sufficiency not only keeps him from prayer for himself, but from prayer for a beloved one who is so clearly suffering. Peter was very willing to exhibit his own strength when he draws his sword in a few more moments and goes on the attack. He is not willing to seek the strength that would have mattered. Now, servanthood is a good and godly thing. This isn't an anti-servanthood message, but sometimes that's true of us too. I'm very willing to practically serve, but am I willing to get on my knees in intercession for this person? That can be true of parents. I'm very willing to teach and to disciple and to discipline and to guard. Am I willing to intercede? for this child in their need. It can be true in marriages. I'm, I'm helpful, I'm willing to be helpful, I'm willing to do things occasionally that are useful and helpful and romantic and kind. Am I willing to intercede? It, it's not that our labors are ir, 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 um, indifferent or they don't matter. It, it's that the, the ultimate strength that is needed by this person that we love is the strength of arms that can hold them up from temptation. That's what ought to have been happening in the garden. God, protect me from the temptation Jesus warned me about. And, and whatever he's facing, be with him. Strengthen him. Comfort him. How much better if that hour had been spent? How, how many years did Peter, James, and John look back and think that was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to pray? And we didn't pray. Prayerless, they go into the greatest temptation of their lives. Prayerless, they go into the greatest opportunity of their lives. Prayerless and proud, they face the moment when God the Son in human form could receive either their loyalty or their betrayal. It wouldn't have changed the outcome. It wouldn't have changed what God intended to do that night. This was simply their moment. And prayerless, they face it. R.T. France says the specific temptation facing these three disciples was that of denying Jesus. And their failure, when the test came, here, here's I think the point we need to see, see this connection. Their failure when the test came, if you just read it in context, was due to their failure now to share in Jesus' preparation for the ordeal. Did they fail sinfully? Did they sin by abandoning their Lord Jesus, Peter rather, by denying Jesus? Yeah, yes, they sinned, but the connection that Matthew is making and that I think France is right when he makes this point, the connection between their prayerlessness and their sin has to be seen. We tend, because we're pragmatic Americans, we tend to look at their sin, and it was sinful. The action was sinful. They should have resisted that temptation. Peter should have said, yes, I know him. He's my master. They should not have fled. They should have stayed with him to the end. 
Yes, they sinned practically, but prior to the action of sin, there was the pride of self-confidence that conditioned them to fall. That's the connection that Francis is making, that Matthew is making more importantly. They face it with prayerlessness, and so it is, if you you want to take Matthew's word for it, no surprise, so to speak, that Jesus' prophecy is fulfilled because Jesus' warning was neglected. Watch, watch and pray so that you may not fall into temptation. They do not watch and pray. They fall into temptation. The implication for every disciple is very plain. If we don't watch and pray, you will fall into temptation. Prayerlessness leads to sinfulness automatically. Self-confidence leads to a fall. Pride goes before a fall. We have not the strength to resist the cliff in front of us. We need stronger arms. Sadly, we know the outcome of the story. The disciples flee. Peter, three different times, enters into the temptation that Jesus warned him about. He craved his comfort and reputation rather than honoring his master. And, and this is a, ultimately a tragic failure for Peter and James and John, which also functions as a warning for us. We are needy disciples facing a world of temptations with hearts that are prone to self-confidence. We desperately need to hear the word to watch and pray. The Spirit is willing. We don't intend to sin. You don't start your day saying, I think I'll deny the Lord today. No, you go into your day self-confident, not as an apostate, but self-confident. You fall over the cliff. I fall over the cliff again and again. And why does that happen? Because though we know it's coming, we refuse to seek the Lord's help. We have this desire in our hearts to honor him, but our flesh, our pride, our self-confidence positions us for failure because it keeps us from asking the strength of our God. To change the metaphor, it's like seeing a bunch of holes in the bottom of your boat and launching it anyway, expecting it to float, rather than saying, God, I need you. My soul is weak, it leaks, it's not strong, it can't brave the waves. Give me strength, give me strength to overcome this temptation. It's true for our own souls, it's true in how we relate to others. Others cannot face the temptations that they will face apart from their own prayer and the prayers of the church for them. One reason you have been given as a relative or a friend of other Christians is so that you can pray for God's strength to sustain them in what they face. Actually, it's often precisely in praying for others that we overcome our own temptations to selfishness and pride. Very difficult to remain bitter at someone you're praying for. Very different, difficult to remain unforgiving of someone that you're interceding for their soul. We need the words of Jesus, watch and pray. We must not be self-sufficient or what perhaps might be worse if we've gotten to the point where we're not particularly concerned about falling into temptation at all. The fall doesn't view, doesn't seem sinful to us so we don't watch and pray. We need this, we need this exhortation, but what if we haven't heeded it? What if you're like me and we're all the same, we know there are areas of life where we have been crawling toward cliffs of temptation in relationships and in our personal life and our thought life and and we have not Ask for his strength. What if that's us? Well, we need more than the prayers of the disciples. We need point number two, the prayers of the Savior. 
the prayers of the Savior. The passage says that Jesus was in an agony, and we know why. He was facing the cross, and he knew it. He had predicted exactly what would happen because he had read the Scriptures. He was facing the abandonment in his human nature of his heavenly Father who he had been in fellowship with from the womb. And to add insult to that most painful injury, his friends would betray, deny, abandon him. The crowd who had just received his teaching and miracles would turn against him and shout for his persecution. The enemies would sneer at his broken, naked form and revile him. He would suffer impossible physical agony, and then finally he would die. And only his faith in biblical promises assuring him that God the Father would not leave him forever in the place of death would be with him in the end. That's why he's in an agony, because all of that looms before him, and so no wonder he is sorrowful unto death. No wonder in his human nature, and yes, there is a mystery here, how God the Son, who in his divine nature knows all things, but in his human nature submitted to a limitation of knowledge that somehow we can't fully understand, could pray to his Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Because he sees the cup of God's wrath bubbling with fury, tilting towards him, and the horror of it causes him to shrink back and ask, in my human nature, is there any other way for people to be saved and your will to be completed? So he is in an agony, and what does he do? He Praise. He prays. He prays desperately because he is facing a temptation beyond what anyone has ever faced, and he would not be allowed to indulge the temptation to escape in the slightest way. Have you considered the miraculous truth that God the Son in his person existing in two natures, human and divine, was simultaneously sustaining the suffering that was causing him pain? And he could not use any power to mitigate that pain in the slightest way. You have never faced a temptation like that. I have never faced a temptation to exhibit the least little bit of a lack of self-control to mitigate crucifixion and the abandonment of my father and the enemies of God reviling me. Have you considered the self-control of Jesus Christ on the cross? that he held on to to his last breath to not return reviling to them, to not mitigate his own suffering, to continue somehow in the mystery of it in his divine nature to sustain those who were impaling him. There has never been a temptation, there will never be a temptation that comes close to the cliff that he was hurtling towards. So he prays. He prays, is there any way I can avoid drinking this cup? But he prays in submission, not my will. I I think likely he is speaking there in his human nature that is submitted to the Father, not my preference, humanly speaking, to face what I am about to face. But that should not be the ultimate. The ultimate should be your will be done. Is there any other way? And if not, your will be done. R.T. France again says this. The issue is not whether or not Jesus should accept the Father's purpose, but whether that purpose need include the horrifying cup of vicarious suffering or whether there is some other way. Hence the remarkable blend in this verse of a clear request with the acceptance that that request might not be granted, a blend which could well be imitated in much of our praying with its often peremptory demands. The only issue that matters is what are the limits of the will of God. Jesus' prayer is an exploration of those limits, but never attempts to break outside of them. If it be possible... Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, 
but as you will. My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. How precious is that prayer to us? How crucial is that prayer to our prayer lives? It's precious because it indicates his resolve to save us from our prayerless pride, to pay for the countless moments of self-confident arrogance where we have fallen into temptation and required punishment from God. His prayer, your will be done, is an indication that he will pay for all of those moments. Every moment that you and I should have prayed and didn't and sinned and should not have, Jesus paid for. And when he prays your will be done, that's what he's praying for. He was plunging himself into the cup of God's wrath while resisting the temptation to serve himself in our place. He was facing the punishment for our plunges into sin again and again and again by plunging himself into the wrath of God so that all of our prayerlessness and the pride that causes it and the sin that is the result of it could be forgiven, could be atoned for from Adam and Eve who ought to, in that moment of temptation, said, God, help, this snake is tempting me to you and me last week facing some temptation on our own, confident that we can face it, and then indulging in some sin. All of those moments throughout all recorded history for all of God's people were compiled into that cup and poured on his head, and he took it all so that we need not drink any of it. And that prayer, your will be done, was his declaration to heaven and hell that he would drink it all. So that your prayerlessness and mine, if you are a Christian, has been paid for. And the sin that is the result of that self-confidence has been paid for by the blood of Jesus. So that you cannot make up for past prayerlessness by praying more in the future. You can only make up for it by trusting in Jesus' atoning blood. Very important point. When you hear messages about prayer, the first thought everybody has is, I will pray more next week because I didn't pray last week. The first thing you should think is, is, thank the Lord that he died for my prayerless soul. Because my prayers atone for nothing. They make up for nothing. Praying harder for the rest of my life couldn't atone for a single moment of pride and prayerlessness last week, let alone a lifetime of it. Jesus and Jesus alone pays for the pride and sin that comes from the prayerless soul. And that's what he's praying your will be done. So he pays for it. But there is more. Jesus didn't just give us his suffering for our sin. He gave us his righteousness in our place. So, so here he prays, as it were, also in our place. We need more than just the forgiveness of guilt. God doesn't welcome the neutral into his presence. He welcomes the righteous. So we needed more than just payment for our sin. We needed a record of righteousness. But where could we find one? Do you know anybody who has always prayed, who has always obeyed, who has seen every temptation coming, has sought the strength of the Lord, has always flown over it in the arms of God's strength? Do you know anybody like that? Yes, you know one you know one, and miracle of miracles, that one gives his praying record to you. So here he prays in our place, and here is the prayer that stands in place of, not just in payment of, but in place of all of our prayerlessness. France again makes this connection. He says, Matthew's explicit mention of three prayers by Jesus on this occasion may be intended, I think it likely is intended, to contrast with the three denials in verses 69 through 75, which will result from Peter's failure to share in Jesus' prayer. 
based on the teaching of Paul, it is not just the death of Christ that saves us, it is the righteousness of Christ that saves us. And here is the righteousness of prayer to overcome temptation in place of Peter's prayerlessness and yours. So when we have seen the unfairness of suffering and refuse to trust God, Jesus' prayer of submission stands in our place. It's not just that he pays for it. It's that when God looks at us, he sees a submitted son facing the unfairness of suffering. When we have refused to submit to our own crosses and we have grumbled and we have complained and we have fallen into that temptation, Jesus' prayer of willing obedience and suffering stands in our place. If we have refused to love our enemies to the death, Jesus' prayer of submission stands in our place. Do you want to know what your legal record of prayer is in heaven? It's right here. Your legal record of prayer in heaven is right here. Your will be done. It covers over, I hate this. This isn't fair. Why is God doing this? I don't want anything to do with that person. They've done me wrong. I want to get back at them so bad. In heaven, the legal record of your prayer, if you're a believer, your will be done. When we have neglected love for our friends, Jesus' prayer of submission stands in our place. When we have been self-sufficient and cocky and arrogant and self-assured, Jesus' prayer of humble submission stands in our place. When God looks at us, he sees us as the one who has said in the face of impossible duties and difficult mockery and unfair challenges, your will be done, Father. He sees us as the suffering prayer warrior in the garden, though actually we are the disciples asleep in self-confidence. So in a double sense, because it indicates his willingness to die for our prayerlessness and because it fulfilled the prayers we've never prayed, this prayer is precious to us. What should it do to us, this prayer of the Lord Jesus? It ought to teach us to pray as those who belong to the Savior. Not because we can make up for our prayerlessness, but because having been prayed for by Jesus, having been saved by his death, having his righteousness, giving us access to God's favor, we now want to pray like him. So we say to him, teach us to pray. What temptations will you face this week? List them out in your mind right now. You know what they are. Maybe there'll be some surprises, but there'll probably be a lot of things that if you thought about it, aren't that surprising. What temptations? What cliffs of sin are yawning before you the moment you drive out of this place? Will you face temptations to neglect prayer and his word? Pray. That's one of the reasons we gather together every week so that things we've forgotten to do during the week, we can pray for strength to do. Pray. Will you face temptations to fail to love others this week? Is there someone that it's hard for you to love? You can pray that he place his love in your heart and that you not fall into the temptations of bitterness. Will you face temptations to give in to the approval of man, the fear of man this week? Here is the Lord Jesus telling you, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Husbands, will you see your wives suffering and facing temptation and not pray for them? How many wives' temptations are amplified because their husbands did not pray for them? 
Wives, will you know of your husband's temptations and not pray for him? How many husbands' failures are amplified because their wives did not pray for them? Children, will you grumble against your parents' impatience and not pray for them? How many parents struggle with impatience is amplified because their own children will not take the time to pray for them? Will you face temptations of the screen, temptations of anger, temptations of worldliness, temptations of gluttony, temptations of laziness, temptations of selfishness? Yes, you will. We live in a fallen world, and your heart still craves evil. Watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. The Lord Jesus paid for our prayerlessness. So if we have been a prayerless people, his death atones for it. His prayers give us a record of righteousness, which means however prayerless we have been, we can come boldly to the throne room of heaven claiming the prayers of Jesus as representing us. That is astonishing news and ought to motivate us to pray as those who don't belong to our own strength, who don't belong to our past record, who don't belong to our future promises, but as those who belong to this Jesus, who died for us, prayed for us, lives for us, and invites us to watch and pray. Pray in the morning, pray on your way between things, pray in the car, pray out loud, pray with others, pray for your children, pray for your spouses, verbalize to God your awareness, I am weak, you are strong. Jesus, give me strength to overcome this temptation and give glory to you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would have a holy hatred of sin in our heart so that we would care about the temptations to sin. And Lord, that we would run to you for strength. Lord, forgive us for the countless times we have entered meetings, moments, interactions, stretches of being alone without a prayer for your strength. Lord, renew us. Lord, let us respond to this invitation that we would watch and pray. Lord, thank you for being willing to embrace the will of salvation and to die in our place. And thank you that your prayer stands for us. In light of those truths, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray, Lord Jesus. In your name.